Welcome to the City Club of Chicago. I'm Dr. Edward H. Mazur, Chairman of the City Club of Chicago. We're glad that you could join with us today for our virtual Zoom program. Our speaker is Arnie Duncan, and the subject, Reimagining Public Safety. The City Club of Chicago, founded in 1903, the most important public affairs organization in the city of Chicago. We want to thank our sponsor today, Mesereau Financial, one of the many fine companies that understand and appreciate the need for dialogue in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. Our speaker today, Arnie Duncan, is the founder of CRED, Create Real Economic Destiny. He's the managing partner at Emerson Collective. Prior to that, Arnie Duncan served as Secretary of Education during the administration of President Barack Obama. Prior to that, he was the Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Public Schools. While Chief Executive Officer of our public schools, Arnie Duncan won praise for uniting the city's stakeholders behind an education agenda that included the opening of 100 new schools, expanding after school and summer learning and early childhood learning and college access programs. He dramatically boosted the caliber of teachers and built public-private partnerships around a variety of education initiatives. Arnie Duncan is a magna cum laude graduate from Harvard University in the last century, 1987, majoring in sociology. The Emerson Collective is an organization dedicated to removing barriers to opportunity so that people can live to their full potential. The Emerson Collective centers its work on education, immigration reform, the re environment, and other social justice initiatives. Thank you for joining us today. Arnie Duncan, over to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I desperately wish we could do this in person rather than via Zoom, but just the reality of where we are today. So as you said, we started Chicago Cred almost exactly four years ago in 2016 with a laser focus on trying to reduce gun violence here in Chicago. And we have just an extraordinary team, amazing, amazing community partners across the city who are working so hard to try and make our city safer. And this work is deeply personal for, for all of us and maybe, you know, maybe for slightly different reasons. Um, some of us do this work to try and give children their childhoods back to allow them to grow up free of fear and trauma. Um, others do this work to try and right their historic wrongs. We have many folks who, uh, when they were young, unfortunately inflicted a lot of damage on the community. And they've absolutely dedicated their lives to giving back and strengthening the community now that they have a chance to do that. Others do this work to fight systemic and structural racism that has existed forever. There's probably no more significant sign of that than the cheapening of black lives, seeing how disposable um, our black lives are here in Chicago. They're a constant loss with very little uh, being done about it. I'll just say for me, it's, it's very, very personal, uh, as it is for all of us. I started to lose friends to gun violence when I was a teenager. Uh, growing up playing basketball on the south and west sides, there were a set of guys who were a little bit older than me who often protected me, gave me safe passage in and out of neighborhoods. And when I was a teenager, I started to lose some of them. And when you're that age, it probably shapes you and honestly scars you in some ways that are difficult to talk about. Fast forward to my time at CPS and we can talk about uh, the successes and I'm happy to talk about those. But on, on my watch during my seven and a half years in the Chicago public schools, on average, we had a child killed every two weeks due to gun violence. It was a staggering rate of loss. Uh, thank goodness never in a school, but walking to the corner store, riding the CTA bus home after school, shot by an AK-47 from 100 yards away, uh, Wednesday morning, 7.30 a.m., getting ready to go to school. Um, almost always, I met those families after they had lost their child. And my wife and I had two young children at the time, and just the unfathomable grief, trying to talk to them, attending those funerals, going to classrooms where there was an empty desk and trying to talk to those students and make sense of the senseless. Uh, that was by far the hardest part of, of the work. Um, very naively, when, when my family and I when we moved to DC in 2009, uh, sort of assumed things couldn't get worse here in Chicago, that we were at rock bottom. 
And for a whole host of reasons, things got a lot worse uh, here in Chicago. So coming back home to the city, a city that had given me every opportunity, educationally, athletically, socially, culturally, this felt like the crisis facing the city. And it one just we, we wanted to take on directly. Um, the losses have continued, unfortunately. Um, we have lost young men that we work with. Um, very, very tragically, three months ago, we lost a 20-month-old son of one of our young men who was killed in a car seat in his mother's car on the way to the laundromat. Um, we all deal with trauma. We all deal with extraordinarily difficult situations and heartbreaking loss. But that one was different uh, for me and for all of us. Um, I've never seen a casket that small. Um, I've never seen a baby that peaceful <laughs> and that still sitting in a casket. It's a sight none of us want to see again. Don't want to experience that again. Um, seeing that young father, devoted father, that young mother, extraordinary mother, seeing their unimaginable grief, um, we have to do better <laughs> as a city. We owe it to our, our, our neighbors, to our citizens. Uh, we owe it to ourselves. We have to get to a better place. And so that's what this work is all about. Second point I want to make is that we do this work with tremendous humility. Um, we are making mistakes every single day. We are learning hard lessons every single day. Um, we don't begin to have all the answers. Uh, I'm going to raise some, some ideas here, open to feedback, open to pushback. Um, but we all have to recognize, one, that we can't do this by ourselves. And two, very importantly, none of us, none of us are doing enough now. We're not winning. Chicago is not winning now. We have to collectively move to a better place. And then finally, I'm going to walk through a slide deck before we get to a, an interview, a video interview with some of our team that's doing such extraordinary hard work. So we're going to go through a lot of numbers and a lot of data. But I really want you to understand throughout this, remember throughout this, this is a deeply, deeply human story. Um, this is not about stats. This is not about numbers. This is about real lives. This is about mothers who have lost multiple sons. This is about mothers who have lost sons and grandsons. This is about children who have lost fathers. This is about fathers who have lost children. This is about a level of trauma that people are growing up with due to multiple losses across the South and West sides that's almost unimaginable. And we say all the time that hurt people hurt people. The amount of hurt that our children um, on our South and West sides are, are experiencing today is unbearable. And we have to help them heal. We have to create a, a safer climate. We have to create an environment when they can just be children, when they can go to the park and play, when they can just give, give, give them their childhoods back. And that's what this work is about. What I'm going to try and do is sort of frame the context of where we are in Chicago, um, how we got here, and where we need to go. So if we could start the slide presentation, please. Uh, we'll start with slide two, if you could pull that up. So we're always trying to you know, learn from what's, what's going on in other cities across Chicago and three, uh, across the country and with three largest uh, cities being New York, Chicago, and LA, always look at those comparisons. And unfortunately, Chicago does not come across looking very, very good in any of this. Um, first, just in terms of level of violence, Chicago has five times, five times the level of violence of New York and three times the level of violence of LA. You might wonder, let's go to slide three. You might wonder about policing. Do, do they have somehow less, uh, do we have less police in them? It's actually very counterintuitive. In fact, that's not true at all. Chicago has twice as many police as LA per citizen. Twice as many as LA, but still three times the level of violence. Almost exactly the same number of police per citizen as New York, but five times the level of violence. That's where we are today. If we go to slide four, Let's look at the historical trends. Um, for a long time, going back over 100 years, levels of violence were, were relatively similar between the three cities. But once you get into the, uh, the late 1990s, into 2000s, New York and LA were able to significantly reduce the level of violence in their cities. While here in Chicago, we have absolutely struggled to do that. If you go to slide five, there's something called the clearance rate, which I'm obsessed with. It's the percent of crimes that get solved. And so much of the violence here is driven by retaliation. One group, one click loses somebody. They don't see justice in the traditional systems. And then they, they uh, go to street justice. So the clearance rate is the percent of homicides that get solved. And we're going to talk about homicides throughout this, this uh, presentation. 
very clearly Chicago, again, despite having significantly you know, more police than L.A., same amount of police as, as uh, New York, um, we just simply don't solve those, those homicides. We don't solve those, those murders at anywhere near the rate of the other cities. And unfortunately, that in and of itself is a driver of increased violence here in Chicago. If you go to slide six, just sort of stepping back, looking at this from a broader perspective, talk about mass incarceration, whether that's made, made us safe or not. The United States has less than 5% of the world's population, but a quarter of the world's prison population. Think about that. Less than 5% of the, of the world's population, a quarter of the world's prison population. So clearly, if mass incarceration made us safer, the U.S. would absolutely be the safest country in the world. And we know that's not true. And I think the same corollary is true here at the local level for Chicago that if more police made us safer, Chicago would be the safest city in America. And unfortunately, that's not true either. Let's dig into the Chicago story a little bit. Let's go to slide seven. And Chicago, as we all know, is a, is a city of neighborhoods, of amazing neighborhoods. Um, while this gun violence issue is an issue for the entire city, it is also highly, highly concentrated. So 80%, 80% of the violence takes place in 15 of Chicago's 77 neighborhoods. Most of the victims are young black men between the ages of 16 and 32. And the profile of both the perpetrators and the victims of gun violence um, are the same. It is often literally the exact same person caught in these cycles of violence. And so uh, with our team Chicago Credit, again with amazing community partners across the city, we've concentrated our efforts on those 15 neighborhoods uh, where we see the, the most violence. If we go to slide eight, these numbers may, uh, may really stun you. And again, for me, this is not just about trying to save money by any stretch. This is about trying to reduce trauma, increase safety, give children their, their childhoods back. But the cost, just the, the financial cost of violence in our city is staggering. Um, according to the Boston Consulting Group, that's done some amazing work in this space. Um, just this year alone, gun violence has cost Chicago uh, more than $3.5 billion. Every single homicide in Chicago costs our city about $1.5 million, um, and non-fatal shootings uh, cost us significantly as well. And these are just hard economic costs. When you talk about loss of revenue, we talk about people fleeing the city, we talk about less tourists coming to Chicago, we talk about the reputational hit that Chicago has taken nationally and internationally, the cost would be much higher than this. So if, if for no, no other reason, um, besides all the other things, uh, of just trying to do the right thing economically and financially for our city, the status quo is simply unacceptable. As I said, if we can go to slide nine, we started this work in 2016. And uh, we have two metrics, homicides and shootings. Our, our scorecard is very, very simple. And for three consecutive years, uh, 2016 we started was a horrific year. Um, earlier, the Laquan McDonald uh, video had finally come out, out after being covered up. Um, tremendous unrest, tremendous un, uh, anger in the community, chains and police chiefs, uh, violence went up significantly. 2016 was a horrible year. Then each year, 2017, 2018, 2019, we were seeing double digit reductions in violence, 15%, 15%, 13%. Um, it's never enough, it's never fast enough, but as a city, we were moving in the right direction. But then if we can go to slide, uh, slide 10, 2020 has just been an absolutely horrific year for us. Um, and the start of the year started bad, January is bad, February is bad, uh, COVID hit, things got worse. The George Floyd uh, homicide, uh, the murder there in Minneapolis, things got much worse uh, here. For us as a team, that was uh, definitely the hardest time uh, the, those six, eight weeks Post the George Floyd murder, we experienced a level of loss that we've never seen anything like that before. And so across the city this year, a 51% increase in homicides. Um, unfortunately, if that rate continues this year, we will give back all the gains we made in 2016, sorry, in 2017, 2018, 2019. Um, and again, unless things turn in this last quarter, we're going to end up very close to 2016 rates again. None of us, again, can, can feel good or feel like we're doing enough. 
But it's always important to dig into the data. And as you look at the 15 most violent neighborhoods, almost every single one is up substantially, uh, many up more than 100% this year. Um, when we see the most violent neighborhoods increasing violence at those kinds of rates, obviously the numbers for the city are gonna go up dramatically. But when you see that in many places, but not in every single one, you have to really stop and try and understand where things are working and why. And I'd call your attention to that red circle to Roseland. Roseland's on the far south side of Chicago. It's a neighborhood where we started working four years ago. It's a neighborhood where we have worked the longest, worked the hardest, have the most comprehensive team. And that neighborhood this year, despite the pandemic, despite the unrest and anger after the George Floyd murder, that neighborhood is down 33% to date um, compared to a city that's up 51% in terms of violence. And so the question I want us all to think about, and we're going to dig into a little bit, is why? Why is the rest of the city struggling so much and Rosen's violence is still down in a horrific year, is down by about a third? If we can go to slide 11 and just start to unpack that story a little bit. As I said, we started working in Rosen in, in 2016, and to date we've worked with over 300 young men. It was really interesting. We started doing this work. We always try and work with those that are most at risk of, of shooting and being shot. Um, we, we got an estimate from the UC Crime Labs that they thought that we needed to work with about 275 young men um, in Rosen. There's no exact science there. That's just the ballpark. But those were, that was the number of men who they thought were, again, the most at risk of being caught in those cycles of violence. And uh, today, again, we've worked with actually more than that, over 300 now. The violence here in Chicago is hyper-localized. Unfortunately, this is not South Side versus West Side or this huge gang versus that huge gang. Those days are over. This is unfortunately literally often one block fighting a group of guys two blocks away, guys they grew up with, who know each other's families, um, who have you know, long histories, but unfortunately are uh, just at, at literally at war now. And just in that one community alone, there's many as 50 different cliques of guys who are at different times in conflict with one another. So how do you try and address this? We try and address it in a really, really comprehensive way. And there's no, again, no one easy way to do this. And as I said earlier, it's not like we have this perfectly figured out by any stretch. We're making lots of mistakes every single day. But there are five pillars to our work. Um, the first one is street outreach. We have a team of, of almost 40 men who work in street outreach. They have to have what we call LTO, License to Operate, they have to have tremendous trust and credibility with guys who are still on the streets. Um, they're basically our HR team. They're the ones who recruit young guys who are caught in these cycles of violence to come into our program and to give them a chance to turn their lives around, to transform, to do something different. Once guys come into our program, we assign every single guy to a life coach. And our life coaches are simply extraordinary. And you'll, you'll hear from one of them in a moment. We say all the time that experience is the best teacher, but it doesn't have to be your experience. And our life coaches, not all, but many of whom unfortunately served uh, many years uh, in prison, have come out and have devoted their lives to giving back to young men, to giving them a chance to live better lives, to not make the same mistakes they did. Um, some of our life coaches, unfortunately, because of the time they served, lost the opportunity to, uh, to be a parent to their own children. Um, and now because of their paternal instinct, have a chance to be, to be father figures uh, to our young men um, who are coming into our programming. Third is our clinical team, which is led by, by Dr. Tyler. And it is just extraordinary, the work they do. Um, I can't overstate the level of trauma that our young men are dealing with. This is not post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not post anything. This is present, this is current. And for many of our, our young men, um, it's been basically from the day they were born. Um, it's not like life was perfect until 15 or 16 and somehow the wheels came off at, at that point. I have so many different stories I could tell you, but one of our young men told me that his earliest memory, his earliest childhood memory was of his father shooting heroin. Um, that's what he remembers from childhood. Um, another young man told me, he said, Arnie, um, I grew up in a household uh, full of guns. I wish we would have had toys, um, but we grew up in a household full of guns. And I thought about my childhood uh, growing up with two parents who were educators, we grew up in a household full of books, and guess what? My sister and brother and I all became educators. This young man grew up in a household full of guns, and guess what? Unfortunately, he became a shooter. So what our clinical does is help men who are, who are hurt, who are dealing with immense and complex trauma 
start to heal, start to process that, and be able to move forward. Uh, then we have an employment and training team. And our whole goal is to move guys from the street economy, which almost inevitably in Chicago leads to gun violence, to the legal economy. And being able to work with us for a period of time, nine months, 12 months, 15 months, 18 months, whatever it might be, gain the skills. And then we have over 40 employers who hire our men at the back end. And I always say, uh, these are men. They're, they're not boys. Um, they're going to eat. They're going to pay rent. They're going to have a roof over their heads. They're going to feed their children. Um, they're going to do it in the legal economy or in the illegal economy. They're going to do it one way or another. They're going to take care of what they need to take care of. It's up to us in the broader society to decide which side of the street they're going to work on. And again, having employers willing to hire our men at the back end, um, not out of charity, um, not for any reason like that, because they want the kind of talent and resilience and commitment that our men bring and work ethic, our men can bring to their place of work um, is so critically, critically important. And then we have an education team. And we've had over 100 men across the city receive high school diplomas. Um, we had a, a drive-through high school graduation in this new uh, world uh, at South Shore Cultural Center just a couple of weeks ago. And the depth of emotion there from our young men, from their loved ones, many of whom never thought they would get a high school diploma, some of whom unfortunately dropped out of school before they even went to high school. It's not just the piece of paper, it's the credential. It's them starting to see themselves in a very, very different light and know what's possible. Um, that's, that's been extraordinary. Ballpark cost of what we're spending each year um, through you know, philanthropic support is about $10 million a year uh, in, in Rosen. And the work is not just on individual transformation, it's how do we reduce the conflict between those groups. And our outreach team has negotiated five non-aggression agreements and two peace treaties. And these are so important to stopping the constant back and forth and retaliation, it's called getting our lick back, um, calming those things down, uh, giving people a reason to, 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 to maintain the peace, to be supportive in those efforts, the first step, again, is the non-aggression agreements, what we call playing defense, just agreeing not to go on offense. Once that sticks for a while, then moving to a peace treaty where people can feel free to move um, across the community. Because I said, this stuff is highly complex because the violence is so hyper-localized. Um, often, everyone goes to the same corner store because there aren't multiple places to shop. So you have to make sure that corner store is safe. And it's so interesting as you ask young men, um, what can we do to help you maintain the peace? Uh, one of the, the simple things I think could be just a, a great violence reduction strategy for the city, where they ask for often, um, they ask for speed bumps, speed humps, both in their community and in the community that their opposition, their ops live in. Um, why? Because so much of the violence is drive-by shootings, cars flying down a block, shooting wildly. You put some speed, speed bumps in on both sides, it's a huge deterrent for violence. And it's just the kind of thing that when you're listening, um, to people who actually know what's going on, know why it's happening. Um, they have so much knowledge that they can give to us to help us improve the situation. So I wanna stop there for a minute and just show you a, a brief 10 minute video um, about the real work. Again, this is about real people, not about stats, not about data. Um, just a brief interview I did the other day with one of our amazing partners, um, with Mrs. Jones, Wendy Jones, who leads the Youth Peace Center at Rosen there at 111th Street. Um, Mr. Hicks, who's a phenomenal life coach there, and Malik Tiger, uh, one of the participants, one of the young men that we've worked with. So if we could please show that video now. Thank you so much. Thanks so much to, to Mrs. Jones and Mr. Hicks and Malik Tiger for taking the time to, to have a conversation here. And I really want the city to understand the Rosen story. And while unfortunately the vast majority of the city is up dramatically in terms of violence this year, over 50%, Rose is actually down and down significantly, about 33%. So a city up 50%, Rose and down 33%. Let me be clear, it's still too high in Rose and we still have a tremendous amount of work to do. But that contrast is, I think, fascinating. And people need to understand what's possible. Um, Malik, let's talk about growing up in the neighborhood. Where, where did you grow up? Give people a little sense of, of what that was like. Uh, I grew up in the Rosen community, uh, pretty much with just my mom because my father was sentenced to 10 years in a federal prison. Uh, my life pretty much started spiraling out of control around 2013. 2013, that's when I first caught my first gun case. How, how, how old were you? I, I was just now turning 17. So I was able to go to the county, you know what I'm saying? And then after that, 2014, I ended up getting shot six times. I got shot in my head, my hand, 
my back, my shoulder, you know what I'm saying? And then from there, it was really down here, going back and forth to jail, playing with guns, robbing. How how did you find YPC or how did YPC find you? And what was that transition like? It gave me a whole 360 turnaround. Fire is how I looked at things, fire is how I went about things. And like far as how I just like it 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 opened my, you know what I'm saying, mind to other things and showed me it's, it probably is another way. All the different pieces of the work we, we do, what was the most helpful for you? What was the what piece that really, you know, was the most impactful as you went through this transformation? Uh the life coach. Life Explain life. why. Why? Because like 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 I said, my life coach was six. So I could really relate to him on many different levels, you know what I'm saying? Um, on a, like a normal level, I can relate to him to a street level, like, you know what I'm saying? Like I looked at him as not, probably, not even gonna say as a father, but this is my, you know, my big brother, you know what I'm saying? My extended big brother, you know what I'm saying? Like, and he got your back. And I, I feel like the nights that I was calling his phone, I feel like the, the more, the hands-on thing, that's what did the most for me. This is Jones. You and your husband have run the Youth Peace Center there at 111th Street for you know over two decades. You live in Roseland. You live on you know you've had stuff on on your block. Why do you do this work? Why are you so committed um, to to your community? I am concerned about every child. It hurts me. It's painful to to see someone being misused or just a lack of opportunity for uh, one opposed to the other. Uh, it's very easy for me to to wrap my arms around a young person and just show a little tenderness, a little kindness, a little love. We need consistency. We need ongoing services and support. And we need a lot of people that really care about people that are willing to put their arms around them the way my husband and I and many members of Chicago Cred does. We need that across the city. It's really about having the resources, the services, and the people to connect young people to them. Some may argue that there are services in other communities, maybe, but when a young person don't, really don't know how to get connected to those services, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything for them. So it's almost like life coaches are almost like um, conductors. You know, we, we help lead them to the resources and services, and then we also teach them how to use them and this be a support system as they're trying to redirect their lives. Every community needs that. And explain to the audience, we, we, a lot of different pieces, a lot of different components of our work. We have the outreach teams, we have the clinical team to help guys work through trauma. You have the, the work team, you have the education team, you have the life coaches. I'm coming to Mr. Hicks in a minute, but sort of explain what we're trying to do holistic, holistically. What are those pieces when they add up? What do they mean for young people and for the community? I'd like to say that the first number one piece, and I think that we've all been very successful with, and that's building a relationship. Young people are not going to deal with anybody that they don't have a solid relationship with, and they feel like the person trusts uh, them, they trust the person, and they feel that there's a genuine interest in their well-being. Um, and that, you know, everyone cannot do that. I'm, I, it brings me... Um, a lot of joy and it and satisfaction to see that we have such an amazing team that can really uh, not only extend the services to them, but really interact with the young people so that they're utilizing the services to make change. And there's so many different pieces. Again, we talked about the outreach, the life coaches, the clinical team, the education team, uh, the employment training team. But, but I can make a pretty compelling argument that maybe the most important part is are the life coaches. And that's what Mr. Hicks does all day, every day. You, you come from the streets. You've been through a lot. Um, you can relate to these young guys' experiences in, a way that, in ways that many can't. But tell, tell the audience a little bit about what, what you've been through. Um, so, so, of course, I've been incarcerated um, um, all together um, probably over 15 plus years, um, four different occasions. Um, a lot of trials and tribulations. I actually, it's ironic that I, I actually a lot of the trouble I got into is probably two blocks from where I'm working now. Um, and it, it just feels it just feels good uh, right now to be able to um, get up and have a job. How do you start to build relationships? Start to build trust with, with guys who have every reason to not believe you, to be cynical, to you know just not not give you the time of day. 
How do you break through that cynicism and skepticism and build relationships? So, so, so the key is um, lead by example. Period. Like, I can't tell a Malik Tiger, you can't be outside, you shouldn't be outside carrying guns when I'm straddling the fence. One thing about these young men, they'll do a background check on you as well. <laughs> they'll figure out where you come from, uh, what you was about. And then now they see me, you know, I got a business card. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a grandfather now. Uh, um, you know, I just love, like, this is therapeutic for me. I don't know if people understand that, but uh, this job is my therapy. Right. This keep me from even thinking about relapse. One place we went uh, that I'll never forget was when we went back to Cook County Jail. Mr. Hicks, where you, you spent a whole bunch of time and <laughs> talking to the guys there in, in Cook County. <laughs> what, what was that like to, to go in and then to to come back out together? So so um, at all these years I've been in trouble, I'm always going through the back door of Cook County Jail, strip search, all that. So um, I only said we're going to go to the county and talk. So I actually walk in when staff walk in, which is kind of like a real weird feeling. Didn't get searched. Nobody bothered me. And, I, and, and you know, they normally set up stuff like that for auditorium, but they let me go on a live deck where me and I incarcerated sales. Jail cell, and and to the, and I and I tell people all the time, I, I finally went to the county as a free man, right? And it, and it's still probably one of the most my highlighted moments in my life. But that was that was great. And then the, the ironic part of that story is, two of the young men that we spoke to end up becoming participants, uh, maybe like a year or so later. So that was that was probably one of the, the biggest highlights of, of my life. Um, Malik, tell the audience what you're doing now. Uh, what I'm doing now, I'm working at the Greater Chicago Food Depository. I actually just had a, a newborn son. Uh, I have my own apartment. You know what I'm saying? I'm doing good for myself. I'm trending. Will you tell again, if we, if we were able to do this in 14 other neighborhoods, if we had 15, 20, 25 Mr. Hicks in Garfield Park, in Austin, in North Lawndale, um, in Englewood, how would our city change? Yeah, I feel like it would change tremendously, but I feel like, at the end of the day, change had to come with within first. You have, you have to get tired. You, you have to look yourself in the mirror and be disgusted with who you is. I just want to, I wanted something different. That's it. And I knew that if I came down to the center and I listened and I opened my ears and I opened my mind to something different, I knew I was going to get what I wanted out of the situation. And look at me now, two years later, I'm still working. You know what I'm saying? I'm taking care of my family. All right, look, can you see it? All right, look, so I'm going to tell you about the picture. So that that man right there, that was my uh, first judge in 2013. You feel me? That's that's the man who sentenced me. You feel me? That sentenced me my time to go to, uh, you feel me, and to convict me for the gun case. And I once I seen him, I seen him at my job. You feel me? He didn't recognize me. I'm like, man, what's up? He like, man, who are you? I'm oh, man, you was my judge. He like, uh, you feel me? You know what I'm saying? He like, what's your name? Um, Tiger. He, I remember you, Tiger. You got a really, you know what I'm saying, unique name. So he like, man, I'm just, I'm happy to see you. You know what I'm saying? On a better note, on a better situation. He like, how are you doing? I'm like, man, I'm doing great. You know what I'm saying? He just, he basically just told me like he was happy for me that we seen each other on different notes and just basically told me to keep up the good work. And it meant that meant a lot to me because at you know at one point in time I was looking at this man like man you decide you decide my fate you know what I'm saying and I ain't know if he thought I was just a hoolum or a height but when he seen me this time I felt like he looked at me a whole whole new different space you know I feel like he looked at me as an individual he looked as he looked at me as you know what I'm saying a strong black man you know what I'm saying that was trying to go forward and, and was trying to do the right thing to take care of his family. Thanks, everybody. Really, really appreciate it. There's so much there and uh, trying to unpack it quickly, just four, four quick points. Um, first, I hope everyone just really sees the redemptive power of relationships. I say all the time that programs don't change lives, relationships do. Um, without Mr. and Mrs. Jones, who are just pillars, just rocks in the community, then Mr. Mr. Hicks, then he doesn't have a chance to save lives and do the extraordinary work he's doing. Um, without a Mr. Hicks being able to do this work, then Malik doesn't have the chance to be the incredible force for good that he is now, not just, not just with his own family, but he's recruited multiple guys who used to be with him in the street, streets into our program 
so they can also turn their lives around. Secondly, I hope you really understand the transformative power of hope and opportunity. And one of my good friends, David Doig, who's worked so hard and rose in has created over 2,000 jobs there over the past eight years, talks about when people see something different, when they feel different, they act differently. And it's got to be not some uh, hope in the unseen, but hope in the concrete, hope in the real. And when you create that, whether it's jobs, whether it's life coaches, whether it's a chance to, to travel a little bit, um, that absolutely changes how people see themselves and changes their behavior. Third, and this is so important, that I hope you understand that in many cases, um, we aren't giving our men a, a second chance. We're giving them a first chance in life. And that video that we cut was about an hour. We cut it down to about 10 minutes. But Malik talked, and he, he's, every, every man's story is different, but there's some real common threads. Malik talked about his father uh, getting locked up for 10 years when he's 12 or 13. I asked him at that point, who was his uh, role model? And he said it was a neighborhood dope man. Um, that's what he looked up to. That was all he saw. That was all he knew. Um, all we're doing is later in life for our guys, but we're just giving them a second rational choice. The streets are us. No one has to come work with us. No probation officer, no judge assigns anyone to us. These are men across Chicago. We have a waiting list everywhere we go across Chicago wanting to do something different, wanting a, a first choice, a good first choice at this point in their life. And then finally, this may be the most important point. I say this all the time. I just hope you, uh, you know, think about it if you don't believe me, but trust me on this, that our young men like Malik um, they are not the problem in Chicago. They are the solution to the problem. And as they are going to lead us to a safer city. Um, Mrs. Jones, her team, all of our team, we're working as hard as we can um, every single day. Again, amazing partners across the city. But we're not the ones carrying guns. We're not the ones shooting people. It's young men like Malik deciding to put down those guns to do something else. They are the heroes of the story. They're the ones going to lead us to where we need to go. I'll finish with a couple of slides. I, I really uh, want to open up to your, to your question and have a conversation. If we could go to slide uh, 13, oh, you're, you're there, uh, or slide 13, just a proposal for reimagining what public safety might be. If we go to slide 14, please, I want to talk about just the, the, the economics of this. The police budget for 2020, $1.65 billion. Over time, almost 150 million. Legal settlement, settlements for, for a police abuse, another 150 million. For city funded violence prevention, the kind of work that we're talking about, again, outreach, life, co life coaches, a clinical team, an education team, an employment team to help men transition from the streets uh, to the legal economy, um, only about $11 million, so less than 1%. Um, private funding has been significant for years. And I want to thank all of our uh, funders here in Chicago. More and more national funders are coming to the table uh, to help and support this work across the city. But ultimately, this is a public good. And we need public investment uh, from the city, from the county, from the state. If we're fortunate enough to have a change in administrations in DC, um, hopefully at the federal level as well. But we have to invest in violence prevention, not just trying to solve crimes after the fact. If you go to slide 15, um, this is a, a national study, but it's actually fascinating that for me, if we want to stop violent crime, if we want to stop homicides, then we got to focus on that. But it's stunning how much police are asked to do besides that. Less than nationally, less than 5% of police time is spent on a violent a crime and 95% of arrests are for nonviolent crimes. Those numbers may or may not be exact here in Chicago, but when you think about what's really important, and then actually what we're spending time on, there's a tremendous mismatch there that leads to the level of violence we have. So if we go to, to slide uh, 16, and then I'll, I'll stop here. If you think about, again, 15 neighborhoods that produce 80% of our violence, um, one of those neighborhoods, Roseland, down pretty significantly, um, never enough, a lot of hard work ahead of us. But if we wanted to do an investment about, uh, of about $10 million in Roseland, if we wanted to replicate that in the other 14 neighborhoods, you're looking at an investment in ballpark, you know, 150, $200 million every single year to try and reduce uh, gun violence, to try and create greater public safety. How do you get there? And again, this is one proposal. There may be other proposals. I know it's a very, very tough, you know, brutal budget time. I've managed some very tough budgets. Probably nothing is as tough as uh, 
what you know everyone's city, the state, everyone's experiencing now. But we have to sort of think about investing in those things to give people a reason to put down the guns, which ultimately leads to a reduction in violence. We can't arrest our way out of this. We can't incarcerate our, our way out of this. Um, I do wish we were more effective at arresting those that commit homicide and murder. But again, we have to give people a reason to change their lives. And while I would say, while Malik is an extraordinary young man, he is not unique. There are literally thousands and thousands of young men just like Malik all over the city looking for a chance to do something different, wanting to transform their lives. They're not winning on the streets. They're not getting rich. They're getting chased by the police like Malik was. They're getting shot like Malik uh, was. He's unbelievably lucky to be alive. Um, they're not winning. They're just stuck in a vicious circle, a violent circle, and can't get out. We have to give them a, a, a way to get out, a path out. And if we do that, the vast majority of guys, the overwhelming majority of guys will meet us, will meet us halfway. So if we were you know, to get just one proposal, open to other suggestions, other ideas, but if we were to have a, a few less police officers um, we could actually invest in more outreach workers, more mental health clinicians, more life coaches, more folks doing job, job training, more educational teams. Allow those officers to do their actual job, to focus on the, on, on the real violence, not worry so much about mental health, not worry so much about families that might be homeless and needing a meal, not spending time on those things that are important. Let other folks do that. Focus on reducing violence uh, in the city. If you look at the cost of a police officer, those nearing the retirement age might be $200,000, $250,000 with, with benefits. Um, conservatively, if a thousand positions were left unfilled, that could generate that $150 to $200 million um, that we would need to sort of build these kinds of teams through nonprofit partners, churches, social service agencies um, across the city. Uh, 13,000 police officers here in Chicago. Right now, there are currently 846 vacancies. Uh, in the department. Um, open to other funding sources, uh, wide open to hearing other thoughts, but just trying to think about a way to come at this as a city and to scale what works. Um, what I learned working in the Chicago Public Schools, what I work, learned working in the U.S. Department of Education, that when you find something that's working, um, we can't be satisfied with little pilot projects. We have to take to scale what works. And if putting these kinds of supports, these kinds of wraparound services, this, this kind of love um, around our young men across the city, if that could lead to a reduction of violence of 30, 40, 50 percent, if we could do that two, three, four years in a row, um, we could be in a very different place. Uh, my final statement and open up to your questions that this is obviously a really, really dark and challenging time uh, for our city and for our country. But in the midst of the darkness, um, I'm actually wildly hopeful. I'm actually really, really optimistic. And it's not, again, some hope in the unseen. My hope is based upon watching every single day for the past four years, young men like Malik choose to put down the guns, choose to transform their lives, not overnight, over time. We have good days and we have heartbreaking days. But I know what's possible if we invest in them and give them the supports and resources and love they need to lead us to a much safer city. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Arnie Duncan, and um, thank you to uh, Malik Tiger and uh, Mrs. Wendy Jones and her husband, and thank you to um, life coach Jason Hicks. We found that to be a most stimulating and interesting video that was produced. And now we have a number of questions. Uh, one that I would like to ask right off the bat, uh, Arnie, uh, your proposal that we're going to be talking about advocates the potential of shrinking the CPD, the Chicago Police Department, through attrition and shifting the savings, hundreds of millions of dollars, into outreach, counseling, and alternative responses. So you are not saying eliminate and totally defund the police at all as the way some people, in my opinion, have hijacked those terms and have literally scared the hell out of a lot of people. No, no, far from that. I think we should be very, very clear here. We desperately need the police, um, while trust at the, at, the, you know, struck at the system level is frankly often broken between the police and the community. Um, we work with amazing, amazing police officers 
um, including last night, going back and forth with the police officers who was helping us in a very, very tough situation. So we desperately need the police. Um, what we're saying is that for every uh, dollar we spend on preventing violence, we're spending about $150 uh, on police. We just think that ratio is out of, rat, out of whack. And again, given the fact that per citizen, we have twice as many police as LA and we're still three times more, more violent. Again, same number of police per citizen as New York, five times more violence. Um, more police here hasn't necessarily made us safer. And so what I think we all want is we want to increase safety. <laughs> we want to reduce violence. And so if we just put some resources, again, on a, a city, but on a police budget of $1.6 billion, what we're talking about is investment of you know, 150, 200 million, you know, 10% of that um, behind those opportunities for our young men to turn their lives around. Um, that's the kind of conversation we're just looking to have. And again, I'm wide open to other funding sources. There's nothing magical about that. I'm just trying to look at it during a time of extremely tough budgets um, where there aren't necessarily new funding sources. Um, how do you re reallocate existing dollars? Just one proposal to put on the table. Thank you. We've received several questions, including this one from Kevin Brown, who says there's a lot of data that supports your approach, such as the Boston miracle he mentioned, several others. He'd like to know what are the actual impediments that are blocking investment in this approach? You talk about Roseland with that great success story. Um, and then we look at communities like Lawndale and Austin and Englewood, uh, which seemingly would benefit from the CRED approach. So some of the impediments. Yeah. It's, well, it's fascinating. I really, I, I truly see gun violence as a public health crisis. And I see it actually, it mirrors the, uh, the pandemic that we're dealing with, COVID. And in both of those, we actually know what works. Um, we know how to defeat, how to defeat COVID. We just refuse to do those things due to a abysmal leadership nationally. We refuse to do those things that would help us defeat COVID. We refuse to shut down the economy. Um, we refuse to wear masks. We refuse to, to socially distance. We, we chose to open bars rather than open schools. And we're paying a tremendous price um, in deaths and in, in, in human lives. You know, today, at least 200,000 Americans have died. Um, and what's so heartbreaking to me is the vast majority did not need to die had we done what we needed to do. Um, so it's a lack of will, a lack of courage, a lack of honesty, a lack of transparency, a lack of leadership. That for me is identical to the gun violence issue. Um, we know what works. Um, we know how to save lives. Um, we don't have it figured out perfectly, but we know the different components that collectively give us a chance to be successful. We just haven't done, we haven't executed upon what would, what would uh, lead us to a safer city. So using data, being evidence, you know, data-driven, basing all our decisions uh, upon the best evidence available, tweaking, making adjustments. Again, this work does nothing if it doesn't humble you, adjusting every single day, trying to figure out a better way to do it. But this is a public health crisis, just like COVID. We have to react based upon science, based upon facts, based upon evidence, based upon data. And we just have, and we just have refused uh, to do that. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Ed Burley. I hope I didn't um, mispronounce his name. Uh, he's with Planet Fitness. And his question largely is uh, directed at the, are we leveraging the private sector enough to help solve violence in Chicago? It's a great question. And the, the short answer is we're not. And again, we all have to do our part. We all have to do this together. And again, frankly, none of us, none of us are doing this enough. And it actually really troubles me. Um, you know, every time there's a, there's a, a shooting or you know, a tragic event here in Chicago, um, they put the poor police chief on TV to explain it. I know how hard he's working. I know his heart. Um, he can't do this alone. And we need corporate Chicago to hire our young men at the back end. And I know that feels like you're taking some risk. And I know that might make you feel uncomfortable. Um, but as I said earlier in my presentation, our men are going to make a living. It is up to us, whether it's in the street economy, which will lead to more and more violence, or in the legal economy. We have an amazing group of employers um, who have hired. We have men working in culinary, in, uh, in manufacturing, in hospitality, in healthcare. 
We have two of our men working for law firms downtown. We have one of our men working for Deloitte. Uh, let me be clear. The um, vast majority of these guys have criminal backgrounds. Many have violent criminal backgrounds. But we're not asking employers to hire people straight out of Cook County Jail. Let us and let other you know, nonprofits and you know, churches and social service agencies work with them through this process again for about a year, 15 months, 18 months, whatever it takes. Let them get to a point where they are ready to take that leap. And again, you won't find men um, harder working, more resilient. Many are just natural leaders like, like uh, Malik who want to do something better for themselves and for their communities. And so the corporate side of Chicago has to step up to the plate and has to hire. And if every time they see a, a criminal background or a violent criminal background, um, that's an automatic no. Um, they're part of the problem, not part of the solution. So we've had a set step up. We're so unbelievably grateful for that. We need many more um, to, to take, I don't want to say take a chance, just to look at this pool of talent that they have sort of closed their eyes to historically and understand how much value they can bring um, to your places of work. Thank you. Ernie, is there a, um, you've talked about men, is there a um, female equivalent to uh, credit in Chicago that uh, many of us are not aware of? Well, we, we came to it late and we have a small group of women we're working with in the Rosen um, area. We have an uh, amazing leader, uh, Nicole Muhammad, who's, who, who's leading that work. Um, we do have women obviously caught in these cycles of violence. And so uh, we had a, in our graduation just a couple of weeks ago, we had three women uh, who were graduates and we need to absolutely not just service women, but service the families of our young men. And they're going home every single day. And when home isn't stable, uh, when home is violent, then all the stuff we're trying to do during the day doesn't get reinforced in the evenings. Um, so we are doing some, we're, we're not, none of us are doing enough, um, but we're in that space, both working with women and trying to work on, the, on increasing the range of supports and services uh, we do for, uh, for entire families of our young men. We're also trying to work with younger and younger, uh, I wouldn't even call them men, you know, teens, because unfortunately in too many communities, including Rosen, um, we have younger and younger kids who are caught in these cycles of violence, um, both as victims and as perpetrators. Thank you. Um, this is from uh, James Parsons. He says, I've heard you speak several times. This is by far the most informative and hopeful presentation I've heard. But he asked the question, can you tell us about some experiences in other neighborhoods where you have not been as successful? And what failed that you haven't had to come to grips with in Roseland? Yeah, I think what we're lacking in, in those other 14 neighborhoods is the depth of services, the comprehensive team. We just don't have the resources to do that. And so we've invested heavily in street outreach in many neighborhoods, and that's fantastic. But you can't just have guys out there saying, please put down the guns. They got to have something to send guys to. And what we don't have due to a lack of, you know, just frankly, due to a lack of funding, um, we, we don't have the clinical teams in every neighborhood. Um, we don't have the life coaches in every neighborhood. We don't have an education team in every neighborhood. We don't have the employment and training in every single neighborhood. And so while the outreach is a starting point, um, they can't do this by themselves. Um, we have to, again, have an entire program of four or five adults uh, whose entire jobs are helping our young men make this transition. And so it's a lack of resources um, that, that we're facing in, in these neighborhoods um, and with that, again, with increased investment, um, there's nothing, you know, the, the, the Rosen story is interesting. Um, it's far from perfect and it's definitely not unique. And if we had that, those five pillars covered in every single neighborhood and at scale, again, starting with, uh, you know, 25 guys in Rosen four, you know, four years ago, um, over, th over the past four years, working over 310 guys, you start to reach a critical mass. The last thing I'll say is people have to say, well, how do you find these guys? You know, it's impossible. It's so interesting. You know, two of our team, uh, Craig Nash and Curtis Toller, uh, found that first group of, of 25, 30 guys in less than two weeks. Um, they are looking to get out of the street life. Nobody's winning. Um, we just aren't, you know, it's not like they're disconnected from us. We're disconnected from them. We just have to be out there and at scale with all of these comprehensive services in all 15 of these neighborhoods. And if, if we do that, our city would be in a radically, radically different place. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. 
Uh, this is from Stacy Meekins. A little different kind of question than we've been dealing with. She asks, in your opinion, how can street design and built environment help in violence reduction prevention? Well, I started, I'm not very sophisticated in this stuff, but we had a lot more speed bumps, <laughs> speed humps. I, I don't say this, you know, I, I tell you this in all seriousness. Um, that's what, when you ask guys what they need to maintain those, net, those, those uh, non-aggression agreements, what they need to move from that to peace treaties, often, not always, often what they're asking for is speed humps. Uh, but what we need is, again, going back to, to what David Doy talks about, we just need healthy communities. <laughs> that's what we need. We don't have healthy communities. Um, where we have food deserts, that doesn't help. Where we have vacant lots, that doesn't help. We have abandoned buildings, that doesn't help. Um, where you have a sense of hope and possibility and things growing, um, that changes everything. One of the thoughts I've had is that you know, we have definitely have an, a shortage of, of assets in, in many of these neighborhoods, but the one thing we don't have a shortage of is abandoned buildings. Um, what if we did a, a building program, a construction program, and built 2,000 homes on the south and west sides and used guys from the neighborhoods to help rebuild these homes so people could literally, physically, not just symbolically, physically see their neighborhood being rebuilt. Um, we know we've had a tremendous flight um, of middle-class blacks out of Chicago directly because of this violence back down south. It's a reverse migration. If we could build homes, have guys from the neighborhoods help to build them, um, do housing subsidies, have families come back into these neighborhoods to stabilize them, um, that would be extraordinary. Again, we're in this death spiral. We have to work our way. We have to build our way out of it. That's, that's a huge part of the story in Roseland, um, some on the, on the housing side, but on the jobs front. Um, we've done a little bit with, with housing and construction. Um, many of our guys are handy. They've worked on stuff. They like, they, they like the physical work. Sitting in the classroom all day isn't necessarily where they're the happiest. And so those are the kinds of things that we have to do. And I'll just push again, um, not just you know, a couple homes, not one business, but do these things in scale. We have to invest in these 15 neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, this question is from a City Club board member, Dan Gibbons. Your efforts and success have been incredible. Likely we could replicate them around the country. Putting you on the spot, Arnie Duncan, do you, can you promise us and will you promise us that you will stay committed to Chicago and not return to Washington as the Secretary of Education? We cannot afford to lose you again. No, I, I'm, a, I'm a Chicago boy and you know, love the time in D.C., but you know, our family's you know, very, very happy to be here. And let me be clear, um, I don't think we're succeeding now, far from it. Um, we set a goal at the start of this year to get below 400 homicides. Um, this is gonna stun the audience, but we haven't been below 400 homicides in Chicago since 1965. Um, I was born in 1964. Um, that was our goal at the start of the year. And obviously with violence up over 51% this year, we're not anywhere close to this. So we have so much unfinished business here in Chicago. We have so far to go. And uh, we've been at this for four years. I say all the time, we're making a million mistakes every single day. I can also promise you we're a lot smarter today than we were four years ago. And if we can stay at this four or for another four or five years and really start to scale, um, then I think we can get our city to where, where it needs to be. And for me, just to give our kids a chance to grow up healthy and safe and free of the violence, free of the fear, free of the trauma that's just overwhelming in too many of our communities. So I'm all in. Well, we're very grateful for you. We're grateful for the people that are working with you. We're grateful for the impact that you've brought to the community of Roseland and are working in other communities as well. Final question, shifting gears once again. What do you think of the new coach hired by the Chicago Bulls? <laughs> well, Billy's got a, he and I are about exactly the same age, watched him a lot in, in college and have watched his career and um, he's a proven winner. He's a proven winner. He's a really good, really good guy. I think the Bulls have obviously struggled for, for years now, unfortunately. And uh, I think hopefully he can lead, uh, lead the Bulls to a very different place over the next couple of years. Well, as an academic All-American basketball player that you were at Harvard, we appreciate your insight on that matter. But more important, we appreciate your insights on reimagining public safety. Thank you for taking time from your schedule to be with us today. I would like to remind all of our viewers 
that they can contribute to the City of Club of Chicago. We are a 501c3. We will be hosting this program on our website again tomorrow. And you can go to the WGN Radio website to hear the program all again. Once again, we thank you. Our next program will feature David Greising of the Better Government Association on September 30th. We invite you to join us then. So this is Ed Mazur saying thank you very much for being with us today. And thank you, Arnie Duncan.